It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be there and to have this uh, very, very important uh, issue on how globalization is mutating, morphing, transforming itself, how it is in crisis, as uh, many said. And uh, for that, we benefit from an exceptional wealth of uh, eminent personalities. With, I have to say, and uh, it is really extraordinary to see the complementary experiences and responsibilities that we have around this panel. Let me present the members of the panel. Mazoud Ahmed, President of the Center for Global Development. 35 years career in the IFIs, which is, it seems to me, a, a global record. <laughs> and uh, uh, his, you, you are in a unique position. I had the privilege to work with you a lot of time, if I may, recently in various G20 groups. And uh, I was always impressed by your talent and very deep involvement, which goes on, if I may. Bertrand Badré, uh, managing partner and founder of Blue Like an Orange, which demonstrates some poetry behind the financier, uh, Sustainable Capital, former managing director and CFO of the World Bank, with, again, a lot of experience and particularly, of course, experience uh, uh, in environment, green transition, its financing, as well as all World Bank uh, activities. Bak Dao, former Minister of Trade of Korea, present on Lee & Co, global law firm. You participated, uh, and you participate in the Global uh, Trilateral Commission report on global capitalism in transition. We expect from you, of course, a lot of vision on the trade issue, which is at the heart, of course, of globalization. Thomas Gomard, uh, director of the French IFRI, most important French think tank uh, that uh, Thierry knows very well, and one of the most important in the world, according to the ranking of think tank. Uh, you have a unique experience in ex international affairs and uh, globalization and geostrategy, if I may. Uh, Yushi Osoya is not there, but Mati is there, and uh, Marie is there, Marie Kivinyemi, 41 first prime minister of Finland. You served at the OECD deputy secretary general with a great determination, which was admired, as uh, uh, you were setting up the conditions for strong and inclusive growth. So, you're expert in <laughs> managing a country, in global governance, and in inequalities also. Maybe you could say a word on inequalities. So, uh, I don't want to be long because I am asking all participants to stick to the six, seven minutes uh, in order for us to have the appropriate dialogue with the audience. So, I will be as you know, strict as possible, but you know that. Uh, let me only say that, uh, as I said, this issue is really of the essence. Uh, in a way, globalization always existed. When I am in Palmyra, in Petra, when I see the Silk Road, East, West, North, South trade, it started, uh, you know, a thousand years ago. But it has formidably amplified since the Industrial Revolution and formidably accelerated in the most recent period with, uh, of course, the technology surge, IT, transportation, much lower cost, and uh, I have to say the fall of Soviet Union and the communist world, at least to the extent that it was attached to centralized economy and not to market economy. So we have a formidable acceleration of globalization over the last 30 years. At the same time, we could see a deglobalization trend, which was, of course, also amplified and accelerated by the successive crisis that we had to cope with. But not only, it started before many of those crises, and the uh, impressive observation is that it comes both from the left and uh, the criticism of the negative externalities of market economies when they are generalized, um, negative externalities in climate, negative externalities in uh, inequalities, and that 
criticism is very, very powerful. Uh, on the other hand, there is also the criticism from the, I would say, right-wing sensitivities, nationalism, protectionism, populism, as, uh, as we say, and uh, that, of course, has been also uh, terribly amplified in the most recent period of time. So under those two criticisms, what can we say on uh, globalization? And I would say some of the questions which uh, we could consider important in the present juncture, and I would expect uh, that the conference can be enlightened by the complementary vision of the panelists. First, can we address the negative externalities of uh, globalization on climate, on health, on uh, the economic and financial instabilities which were demonstrated in the last years, on inequality, without losing the benefit of uh, the division of labor at a global level and all the benefit of the catching up of uh, poor countries, uh, developing countries, to become emerging countries and tomorrow as wealthy as the present advanced economy. And of course, this uh, 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 complicated question has to be uh, to take into account the fact that the global governance, the ideal global governance, uh, has to cope with major trends, uh, including digitalization, including the green transition already mentioned, and of course taking into account the fact that the present world is made of market economies, so-called, quote-unquote, capitalist economies, but with very different ideology behind, at least in the social, political uh, dimension. Uh, social democrat uh, market economies, uh, pure liberal market economies, or more liberal market economies, uh, state capitalism, uh, authoritarian uh, societies. So that complicates, it seems to me, formidably, the task of the panelist to respond to the question. So I now turn to the first panelist, Mazoud. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Claude, and uh, thank you, Thierry, for uh, organizing this miracle. Uh, I think for many of us, it is the first uh, in-person international event that uh, we have attended in uh, in close to two years, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to pick up, uh, Jean-Claude, from where you left off uh, and set out why, how I think the process of globalization and the management of globalization is going to become more complicated uh, in the years to come. And uh, let me suggest that uh, we can think of this in terms of uh, different forces that are going to be working uh, in, not necessarily in the same direction and which have to be balanced and managed. And, and I'll offer you five uh, very quickly. The first one is uh, economics. Uh, the, the law of comparative advantage has not gone away. It still suits corporations to think of having a supply chain uh, around the world that enables them to be effective uh, and to produce their products uh, uh, as cheaply as possible. Uh, technology and trade have now expanded that into services. So you see finance, you see other areas where uh, the same kind of globalization is happening. Um, and there's also a huge investment that's been made in global supply chains. So it will be very difficult to unwind them even if the political forces want you to do that. So the economics is going to push us in that direction. The second big force that is going to keep pushing us is demographics. You know, this week in Europe, there is a lot of discussion about the shortage of truck drivers and how that is holding up the transport of, uh, of vital goods. But shortages of labor are going to be a feature of European life for decades to come because the labor force is shrinking. And uh, at the same time, in other parts of the world, notably in Africa, uh, population is growing, labor force is growing. We're going to have the population of Africa double and, and then increase again by the end of this century. 
On top of that, there is a movement of uh, people that is going to be triggered by conflict, by environmental degradation. So the demographics are going to lead to a lot of global movement of people. And this is the one area where actually we are least developed in terms of how to manage it. Our systems are not very good at coping with the movement of people. We have developed the capacity to regulate the movement of goods, little less services, but uh, least of all uh, people. Now, against this, however, I would say there are, there's also one other political uh, objective which pushes us to globalize. And that is what I will think of as the rise of, of global public goods. So there's a growing recognition that our, our lives are impacted by events that can only be managed through global coordination. Obviously the pandemic, yeah, this is the one that uh, becomes so clear, obviously climate change, but beyond that, if you think about uh, uh, AMR, you think about rules on the use of artificial intelligence, you think about cyber terrorism, biological terrorism, all of these will require rules that have to be global, at least covering a large part of the global community. At the same time, look at the difficulties we are having today in coming up with an effective global response even to the current problem of the pandemic, which shows uh, that there are other forces that stop us from moving in response to these three factors that are pushing us to coordinate globally. And these two forces are one, the one you just raised, uh, very much the populist backlash from left and right. Although they come from very different values, their visions of society may be very different, but some of the problems are similar that, that drive this reaction. It's the inequality, it's the sense that uh, uh, the rules don't benefit everyone, some people get left behind. It's the sense of financial crisis, I think people are still re recovering from the shock of 2008. And I would say it's also a sense of not being in control of one's own destiny, the feeling that your lives are controlled by some abstract group of people or some institutions with which you don't relate. And that's why this pullback to want to you know, take more control. Uh, and so much of this is driven by the slogans around taking back control, putting yourself first. Of course, the evidence shows that all these attempts to take back control are, are more rhetorical than they are real, but rhetorical things matter. And the final thing I would say, uh, which is going to be a big force also, is the growing rivalry between the US and China. And you know, if you sit in Washington, that's where I sit, it's very hard to escape just how all pervasive the uh, rivalry with China is in thinking about policy. It makes cooperation quite hard. You know, give you a case in point. Last week, the White House hosted a uh, global summit uh, on COVID. 100 countries and partners at the summit. China is the largest producer of vaccines. It was not present at that summit. I'll give you another example. Some of you may have seen this statement by China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, responding to John Kerry's plea to cooperate on climate. And I'll, and I'll quote his sentence, what he said. He said, the US side hopes that climate cooperation can be an oasis in China-US relations. But if an oasis is surrounded by desert, it will also become desertified sooner or later. So the big question is, how can you, how effectively can we find ways to coordinate and cooperate when the two major economies are going through a process where they are uh, rivals in ways that are spilling over into this effort to cooperate and coordinate. So where does this leave us? Uh, we'll have a lot of discussion about where this leaves us, but let me just say, conclude by saying, 
I think we have to recognize that the management of globalization is going to be not simply a question of economics and finance left on its own. It has to be much more integrated into thinking about domestic and international uh, considerations of political reality and of uh, security uh, and trying to bring those things together will make the process much more complicated and will require a degree of uh, whole of government engagement in managing the elements of globalization, which up to now we have tended to leave to some parts of government and mostly to the private sector. So let me stop with that, Joe Claude, and Thank look you. forward to other comments. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Masoud. It was very clear. I, uh, I uh, like very much your uh, stress on this global public goods that we have to preserve and the fact that global governance is more and more complex with the particularly political element which is uh, stepping in. Now I turn to Bertrand, the metaphor of the oasis with the desert around that was mentioned by Masoud is a good transition to your statement, please. Thank, thank you, thank you Jean-Claude and merci uh, Thierry for your Miracle, I will echo what uh, Masu just said. It's, it's great to be, to be in presence again. Um, yes, we are months exactly ahead of the beginning of COP26 in uh, Glasgow, which is supposed to be one of the key milestones on the mutation of globalization. We are a few months away from COP15 in, in China on uh, biodiversity and nature, which is another key milestone in our way to mutate globalization in the, in the right direction. So let me focus on one of the lubricants of globalization, on finance. Uh, the, the question we are facing is, has finance changed for real, or is it just another, another folk that is covering basically something that has not really changed? Everybody is talking about green finance, sustainable finance, ESG, <coughs> etc. You can't open a newspaper without any reference uh, to these terms. And uh, it seems in a way too good to be true. And so my question today is, uh, because this will be a key ingredient if we really want to change uh, in the direction that was highlighted by both Jean-Claude and Massoud. Uh, are we basically on track or not? So let me make three points to be brief to open. First, we now realize that the, the, the choices that we collectively made and endorsed, actually, we all signed, including the US back now in the climate agreement in 2015, uh, so, in particular, the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in September 2015 in New York and the adoption of the climate objectives in Paris in, in December uh, were predicated on the fact that it will go okay. I mean, the market will align, people will transition, and it will not be that difficult. I mean, there was this kind of, you, you put massive figures, people say it will cost four, five, six trillion per annum, but it's okay because if you compare that to basically the size of, of the money, of the capital pool, if you compare this to the size of the economy, it's, it's a little painful, but the invisible end will make its way. That was kind of the, the, the rough assumption. And of course, we realize that it's not working. Even with COVID, we are not there at all. And so that's, uh, that's the, the real question behind the, the ESG. E stands for environment, S for social, and G for governance. Let me focus on E and S. E, the, the main issue is climate. I mean, now more and more people are familiar. I think the ideas are well understood. Uh, the price of carbon is, is, is a pretty well qualified uh, issue. So I think we are getting there, but despite getting there, we are not there at all. I mean, the process is just starting. Then when you dig deeper into the E, in particular on nature and biodiversity, we are nowhere near where we are on climate, and so on and so forth. So the E is, is, is already a tough, a tough thing. When you move to S, social, it's even more difficult, because again, people agree that slavery is not good, but when you go beside that, you have huge discrepancies in the world. And so it's, it's great to say, yes, we focus on social, but then when you enter into the details, then that's when the problem starts. Uh, and of course, uh, as uh, Masoud has said, uh, between E, S, I don't want to discuss the G, but happy to, to talk later, we should also add probably a letter T on technology, because this is a new wave. How do we handle technology? I mean, we are a little bit submerged by, by everything you say. So that's my, my, my first point. We realize that 
2015, was the objectives were okay, but we did not really seriously discuss the ways and means to get there, and now it's a tough wake-up call. My second point is that we also realize that, that uh, it's more difficult than we think. I mean, the, the, the depth of the changes required is more difficult. I mean, all the reports which we have published, in particular the GIEC over the summer show, it's a long way ahead. In that context, uh, people start to question uh, what's happening with finance? On the one hand, the BIS recently released a report saying that there was a green bubble, and uh, basically too much money willing to look green is chasing too little green assets. So this is really a bad signal. Uh, I wish there are more assets and less value, but that's, that's again, the temperature is, is what it is. On the other hand, there was a very interesting report released by a French business school called EDEC last week, which was really reviewing all the green indices. You know, the MSCI of the world, they all pretend to be green, sustainable, etc. So they really checked in and they realized it's not even uh, ambiguous. They, they realized that it's 12% green or sustainable and 88% no. So you're selling to people products which are labeled green and which actually are not. So it's not yet very well known. I was questioned by a journalist uh, on top of that. Uh, maybe you've heard that DWS, which is a German asset manager, is under investigation by the SEC about potential greenwashing. And a journalist asked me, is it the diesel gate of finance? Is it the way you realize that finance is again lying to us? So I think this is a moment of truth, and the moment of truth is closed. And I think it's very important for, for, for the financial actors to be serious about that. Uh, again, we're not too far from the financial crisis. Uh, I think the financial world is still under supervision, under rehabilitation maybe. And so if there is another big issue, it will be very detrimental to everything we, we, we are discussing. My last point is, uh, when we discuss this green and sustainable finance, we naturally tend to focus on large listed entities. The, 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 I would say the Johnson or Unilever or, or Boeing of this world, uh, but we tend to forget the rest of the world. So there are a few bits and pieces. First of all, the private uh, companies, but also the SMEs, which are not really addressed and which are the, the bulk of the economy. And more importantly as well is, is the emerging and developing economies. And I think this is really where it's important. Where the, the question is, who is going to decide the rules for the world? I'm, I'm talking about the textbook for finance for the next 20 or 30 years. And it's a, it's a difficult question because it, it will basically say what is good and what is bad. And I, want, I can be very specific to, to give you an example. People talk a lot about div uh, diversity and inclusion. I can tell you this has different meaning in every country. When you are in the US, people say it's about ethnic diversity. That's the first point. When you go to France, it's you are prevented from talking about ethnic diversity. So in 20 years, do you want that the French parliament decide whether you discuss ethnic diversity or do you want SNP or BlackRock to decide? That's a real question. And there are many more like this to come. Uh, and vis-a-vis and -vis the emerging and developing economies, which is dear to our art on, on stage, uh, the big issue is are we, what type of norms are, will, will we set? Uh, and I had this conversation with many leaders in the past few months. Basically, if, if the, I would say, the bobo of the world, the rich people say, okay, we want to, to have a cleaner world, a more social world, these are the rules. Uh, and they, they put the bar, in effect, too high for, for a number of countries. In that case, when people could tell me, it's like the Washington Consensus 2.0, instead of having the, the, the textbook of the 1980s and 1990s, you will have a textbook on finance, basically saying, yes, you have to do this, this, and this, which is not reachable. And so people will say, no, but in, the, in, in today's world, there is an alternative to the Washington Consensus. You have China, for instance. So you will have a real thing. You have no master of the world. So who will decide? And the competition will be there. So are we capable of being inclusive with all the world and channeling the necessary money needed to go to the sustainable development goals, to go to climate? Or will we be too comfortable within the OECD country and say, yes, you know, we, we know the rules and that we protect ourselves? The alternative is as bad. The alternative is really to, to say, okay, the emerging and European economies are incapable of reaching our standards, so we'll have a, a two-tier system, a premium impact, a premium green in advanced economy, and a low-cost green and low-cost impact in, in developing economies. So let me conclude there. I think it's ample time that we work on our operating system. 
Uh, again, to, to be simplistic, we, were, we are still in a world led by Friedman's mantra that the social purpose of business is to make profit, which is really uh, irrigating the way we account for things, the way we pay for things, etc. I believe we have to move to a system where the objective of business is to create profitable solutions to the problem of this planet, and to discuss them, and the problem of its people. It's not to say profit is bad, profit is legitimate when it has a purpose. And the question is, how do we get there? How do we open the hood? How do we take our toolbox, put our hand in the engine, when, as I say, there is no master of the world, or where there are too many willing masters of the world? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, Bertrand, for uh, your uh, statement. Je vais dire un mot en français. Vous êtes French speaking, mon cher Bertrand. Merci. Euh, simplement pour vous dire que ce que vous avez dit sur euh, le, la bulle verte, sur... Euh, le verdissement artificiel était très, très intéressant et, et, je dois dire, très à la mode en ce moment, si je lis les différents rapports qui sont faits. Vous êtes au cœur de ce financement sain de euh, la transition verte et euh, c'est vraiment bien ce que vous faites, si je puis me permettre, au passage. Euh, au passage. Euh, nous avons maintenant à aborder la question, peut-être, du commerce, si... Euh, Barctaio veut bien nous éclairer de sa propre expérience. It would be for us a great privilege to have your own experience as a Minister of Trade on this element of globalization. We had, as I said, the formidable expansion of global trade, some weakening of global trade, at least of the correlation between global growth and global trade. Uh, could you enlighten us on the present situation and the future? Please, Minister, you have the floor. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I also want to uh, congratulate uh, Chairman Mongbiel for holding this uh, miraculous uh, conference at uh, this time. And I also want to thank uh, WPC organizers uh, for inviting me. Well, this morning, uh, I would like to share uh, with you uh, some of my thoughts on the topic of this session uh, from the perspective of trade specialists. Uh, because my uh, background is mostly in the uh, trade field. I would like to begin my uh, brief remarks uh, with my observations uh, of some recent trends related to uh, international trade. First, uh, we can see in many countries these days, the general public's view on uh, free trade and globalization have been changed to be somewhat uh, negative. In other words, uh, the general public tend to think uh, free trade <coughs> and globalization are some of the major reasons or causes of high unemployment and income polarization. As you know very well, uh, in this case, politicians use this sentiment uh, for their political campaign in the election and often argue that uh, more jobs can be created through less imports and more domestic uh, production. Buy American, uh, hire American, and also reshoring incentives are the, some examples of recent U.S. government policies aiming to boost uh, domestic employment and production. The second uh, observation is the areas of U.S.-China uh, disputes are being expanded from trade to national security and high-tech competition. The U.S. Uh, claim that the unfair industrial subsidies of the Chinese government is the key issue. And accordingly, uh, the U.S. government launched export restriction measures against China. Interestingly, on the other hand, China argues that U.S. export restrictions are causing a global market failure. Therefore, the in uh, intervention of the Chinese government should be strengthened. I heard this from Chinese experts arguing this kind of stories when they hear about the you know, U.S. Uh, sanction against uh, China. Third, intensified political uh, competition between U United States and uh, China, as well as difficulties coming from the COVID-19 pandemic, have led the U.S. to build its own secure, so-called resilient supply chain for high-tech products such as semiconductors and batteries for electric vehicles. Fourth, the responses to climate change are being strengthened and the scale of digital trade is rapidly increasing. 
Well, these trends uh, have directly or indirectly affected globalization. However, uh, according to some OECD experts, although certain products and specific firms have been negatively uh, uh, somewhat uh, affected by these trends, aggregated data collected by the OECD has not yet shown any significant change of the uh, global value chain structure. We understand each government can use policy measures to pursue its specific national goal, such as building its supply chain at the national level to protect the national security and promote industrial self-reliance. Even in this case, however, firms will try to bypass these measures in order to achieve their own goals of profit maximization. Firms can do this through various means uh, for, for example, diversifying their supply sources, uh, shortening, regionalizing, or even redesigning global value chain, and so on. In other words, uh, firms are always considering uh, various factors such as cost, including wages, access to the resources, availability of intrinsic assets, proximity of consumers, and so on when they construct their supply chain. Of course, uh, firms cannot ignore completely the policies of the government as well as its alliance partner countries. In the case of Korea, as you know, maybe leading firms such as Samsung, LG, and SK have recently decided to make a huge investment in the United States as the U.S. tried to build its own supply chain for semiconductors and batteries. However, if other major countries which are closely related to, China, uh, to, to Korea uh, insist on establishing supply chain at their own national levels. Korean firms may have to invest in Europe, in China, or in Korea. So there are some concerns that maybe this could lead to overinvestment or, uh, and or excessive facilities of the Korean uh, companies in the end. So I think in the future, uh, rapid digitalization, increasing risks of climate change, rapidly growing AI technology, sophistication of manufacturing and so on will influence more on globalization than government policies. Uh, of course, the firms will somehow be able to adapt uh, to these uh, trends and continue their globalization activities. In order to see globalization evolving in the right direction in the future, it would be crucial to provide the right uh, business environment with transparent and fair multilateral rules for uh, various fields. However, today, we do not have any clear multilateral trade rules for important issues which may significantly affect uh, globalization of, of the firm, such as industrial subsidies, measures, to, uh, measures related to climate change, uh, like carbon border adjustment taxes and digital trade. As we are all aware, the multilateral trading system of the WTO does not properly function these days. In fact, it faces most uh, serious crisis uh, since its launch in 1995. Although the 12th WTO Ministerial Conference, the highest decision-making body of the WTO, will be held in Geneva at the end of the next month, but uh, experts uh, do not expect much about the results. So, uh, furthermore, we don't find any uh, leadership among major countries uh, in strengthening the multilateral trading system. So in conclusion, the world trade order will remain unstable and the WTO will not play a constructive role for future globalization. I, I'm, I'm a little bit pessimistic, but I'm sorry for that. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Minister. Uh, you are uh, terminating your statement on a rather somber note, obviously. <laughs> but. Unfortunately, I think it's realistic. Let me say that uh, we are uh, very, very happy because Yushi Osoya, uh, who's uh, in Japan, is joining us. And uh, so, uh, welcome to Yushi Osoya. Uh, he's a professor of international politics at the Keio University and managing director of the Asian Pacific Initiative. So, he has a deep knowledge of the contemporary East Asian international politics. If he agrees, he will intervene after 
Thomas Gomart and before uh, the former Prime Minister of Finland. So, uh, welcome again to Yushi Osoya. He's with us. And uh, uh, Thomas, uh, je vous ai déjà uh, introduit. J'ai dit ce que nous attendons de vous. Uh, essentiellement, peut-être uh, des remarques sur la géostratégie, globalisation et géostratégie. Uh, vous êtes le directeur de French Infi, IFRI, et je comprends que vous allez parler français. Vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Je vais effectivement m'exprimer en, en français. Je voudrais commencer par remercier Thierry et toute l'équipe de la World Policy Conference pour avoir rendu cette, cette rencontre possible. Alors, j'ai deux remarques euh, liminaires pour essayer de réfléchir à, à cette mutation de la, de la mondialisation. La première, c'est, de mon point de vue, euh, cette mutation va être surtout euh, orientée par la nature des relations entre la Chine euh, et les États-Unis. Euh, quelques chiffres pour s'en convaincre. Les deux pays représentent plus de 40% du PIB mondial, plus de 40% des émissions mondiales de CO2. AE2 représente plus de 1000 milliards par an de dépenses militaires. Et quand vous regardez les 100 entreprises les plus profitables au monde, 76 sont ou chinoises ou américaines. La deuxième chose en remarque introductive, c'est que quand on réfléchit à la, à, la, à la mondialisation comme nous le faisons depuis le début de cette session, je crois que beaucoup dépend du choix du cycle que nous observons. Est-ce qu'au fond, on se focalise sur le cycle économique, financier, ou bien est-ce qu'on essaie de trouver d'autres cycles avec d'autres repères historiques, d'autres repères chronologiques Et Je pense qu'il faut essayer de replacer ça aussi par rapport au cycle stratégique, au cycle politique ou au cycle technologique que l'on peut euh, identifier. Et donc la première chose que je voudrais exprimer, c'est que de mon point de vue, euh, la mutation de la globalisation à laquelle nous assistons, c'est d'abord une décorrélation des cycles. Euh, je m'explique, c'est que nous sommes à mon sens dans un cycle stratégique qui englobe euh, le cycle économique et qui, de mon point de vue, a commencé euh, en 1950 par la guerre de Corée. En réalité, la globalisation telle que nous la pensons aujourd'hui est une sorte de victoire intellectuelle chinoise, puisque l'horizon de temps que nous avons tous assimilé, c'est au fond 2049. Et cette idée qu'en 2049, vrai ou faux, ça reste une question verte, mais c'est désormais dans toutes les têtes, 2049 date du centenaire de la République populaire de Chine, la Chine ambitionne d'être la première puissance mondiale dans tous les domaines. Et au fond, c'est devenu notre horizon de temps, et nous pensons les cycles en fonction de cet horizon de temps. Donc le premier, le premier cycle, c'est le cycle stratégique. Le deuxième, c'est le cycle politique. Et là, nous sommes effectivement dans une discussion, parce que nous ne savons pas si c'est l'esprit de Pékin ou si c'est l'esprit de Berlin qui souffle. Je m'explique. 1989, c'est évidemment la chute du mur et le fait qu'il y ait une association très étroite qui s'établit dans les têtes entre le mouvement de globalisation, d'économie de marché et de pluralisme politique, en particulier en Europe, et qui va entraîner l'élargissement de l'Europe. Mais comme vous le savez, la chute du mur de Berlin a été précédée de la répression de Tiananmen. Et au fond, quel est aujourd'hui, plusieurs décennies plus tard, le souffle dominant est-ce que c'est celui de Pékin ou est-ce que c'est celui de Berlin Je pense que c'est une question très largement ouverte. Le cycle technologique, maintenant, bon, on pourrait choisir beaucoup de, de dates différentes, mais celle, celle qui me, me semble la plus marquante, c'est très certainement la création de l'Arpanet, 1969, avec sa double racine, à la fois libertaire et militaire. Et je reviendrai sur cette, cette, cette dualité qui, à mon avis, est au centre de la mutation de la, de, la, de, la, de la mondialisation. Et puis, dernier cycle, peut-être que l'on peut essayer de tracer à très grands traits, c'est le cycle idéologique. Euh, on peut le faire comment, là aussi, comment à différentes dates, mais 1979 est une date intéressante parce que c'est à la fois la révolution islamique en Iran, la prise d'otage à la Mecque, et ça montre qu'on est dans, une, dans un monde aujourd'hui très contra, contrasté pardon, en termes religieux, avec à la fois des formes de sécularisation très avancées dans certaines parties du, dans certaines parties du monde, et dans d'autres parties du monde, des formes de regain religieux qui expliquent aussi, à mon avis, les difficultés que l'on peut rencontrer en termes d'incompréhension réciproque. Le deuxième point que je, je voulais aborder, c'est que cette mondialisation, elle a pour toile de fond une convergence plus rapide que prévue, probablement, 
entre la dégradation environnementale dans ses trois composantes principales, le dérèglement climatique, la perte de la biodiversité, les pollutions et la propagation technologique. La propagation technologique ayant au fond une évolution paradoxale, à la fois une hyper-individualisation et en même temps une hyper-concentration en termes de création de valeur. Sur cette toile de fond, à mon sens, il y a trois constats à faire pour essayer de décrire la, la mutation en cours. Le premier constat, c'est évidemment une redistribution de, de la puissance euh, et un retour du stratégique au sens dur. Nous sommes, de mon point de vue, entrés notamment dans un troisième âge nucléaire en termes, en termes stratégiques. La, le deuxième constat, c'est que cette convergence crée des emboîtements de souveraineté et de juridiction qui rendent la navigation très délicate, au fond, selon les systèmes que l'on utilise, sous quelle juridiction est-on et sous quelle loi euh, se trouve-t-on. Et enfin, ça a été mentionné déjà à plusieurs reprises euh, depuis la, le début de notre discussion, l'accentuation des inégalités que nous observons à la fois euh, entre pays et euh, au sein euh, des pays. Alors, Qu'est-ce qui se dessine Ce sera le troisième point à très grand trait euh, si on essaie de faire un, un effort de, de, de prévision avec l'horizon euh, euh, 2049. D'abord, je pense qu'il y a un phénomène qui est en train d'apparaître, c'est le phénomène de euh, confrontation cognitive, qui est devenu très évident euh, lors du, des différents confinements. C'est-à-dire que les confinements, ça a été euh, le blocage des corps chez eux, mais des, des corps avec des cerveaux qui n'ont jamais été aussi interconnectés par l'intermédiaire des plateformes systémiques. Et cette confrontation cognitive, j'emploie le terme de confrontation parce qu'à mon avis, elle annonce un combat pour des modèles politiques et également pour des modes de consommation ou des, ou des attitudes, en réalité, qui sont en train d'être façonnées par ces canaux. Deuxième, euh, deuxième trait, à mon avis, à, à identifier et qui, qui se dessine, c'est l'apparition de ce qu'on appelle le civilitaire, c'est-à-dire une dualité de plus en plus forte entre des activités civiles et des activités militaires, que ce soit en termes d'innovation ou de recherche, euh, et une dualité que, que nous pouvions faire entre ce qui est relevé de euh, l'économique et ce qui est relevé euh, de la sécurité, qui est de moins en moins faite, en particulier par les deux principaux acteurs, la Chine et les États-Unis. Et de ce point de vue-là, les autres acteurs sont dans une situation très inconfortable par rapport à cette, à cette fusion entre activités civiles et, et militaires. Ce qui pose une question très immédiate, c'est la question des transferts de technologies par rapport aux alliances militaires dans le, dans le futur. Et puis le troisième euh, trait qui se distingue, c'est l'ambition notamment de la Chine d'être neutre sur le plan carbone en 2060, ambition annoncée par le président Xi en septembre 2020, et qui nous oblige à réfléchir aux modalités de la puissance décarbonée. Ça voudra dire quoi être une puissance décarbonée par rapport à un modèle de puissance, au fond reposant sur le fossile, qui a été le modèle des États-Unis pendant depuis, depuis au fond la Première Guerre mondiale. Alors je vais, je vais m'arrêter là peut-être en, en finissant par une, par une réflexion qui, qui vient de la, de la relecture récente que j'ai pu faire de Fernand Brodel. Brodel explique que euh, ce n'est pas le capitalisme qui crée les rapports de puissance, mais le capitalisme se love dans les rapports de puissance et a besoin d'un patron. Et je pense qu'une des clés de la question sur la mutation de la globalisation, c'est euh, va-t-il y avoir un seul patron ou plusieurs patrons Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Thomas. Uh, what you are mentioning, uh, and particularly uh, mentioning Bo Fernand Brodel, reminds me that he made the point that uh, capitalism was not born out of the Industrial Revolution, but was commercial capitalism was uh, flourishing long, long, long before, and of course was uh, really at the heart of the concept. But thank you very much for uh, your description, impressive description <laughs> of, uh, of what's happening today over a hundred years uh, with, uh, I would say, uh, some kind of historical understanding of, uh, of the long-term evolution. Now, I turn to uh, Yushi Osoya. As I already said, uh, he knows better than anybody contemporary East Asian 
international politics. China was mentioned by Thomas a moment ago. What would you say, dear Professor? You have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Indy, for your very kind introduction. I hope that you can hear my voice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me uh, first express my greatest gratitude to, for the organizer of this conference to make this possible, particularly, of course, uh, uh, I'm really grateful for Ms. Uh, yeah to make this miracle possible. And I think that this is not just a miracle, but this is also a very good sign to see the retreat of the spread of the coronavirus, if not the end of the coronavirus disease. But anyway, I, I like to present a point of view from East Asia or from Indo-Pacific region. Because I believe that the current uh, globalization largely comes from uh, Indo-Pacific region. Likewise, the future of the virus, uh, the globalization continues to mutate. We now know that globalization has not ended with the spread of the coronavirus. However, we are seeing the globalization that is quite different from globalization as we knew. Therefore, it is important for us to understand the nature of this issue. And to do that, I like to focus on the three points. The first important point is that we need to look at the Indo Pacific region, what happens in Indo Pacific region. I'm particularly glad that. Uh, World Policy Conference has been quite kind to Asia or Asians, Asian participants. That's why in Britain we have two Asians, not just one. I fully understand that Korea is an important country and that Korea can represent Asian voice. But uh, two is better than one, I'd say. So that's why I uh, think that the double PST really reflects the current international politics. Uh, so in this sense, I think that the globalization or dynamism of globalization now will only come from the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, secondly, I like to focus on the importance of uh, digitalization, as previous speakers already mentioned. I like to say that today we are seeing the digitalized globalization. Therefore, I can join in this session by using the benefit of the internet. It is sometimes very difficult to see, directly see uh, uh, cyberspace. But on the other hand, uh, we have to feel and we have to be aware of the importance of cyberspace. And the large part of globalization actually now comes from in this cyberspace. So that the combination of the dynamism both in, in the Pacific region and the digital cyberspace is nowadays very important, I would say. Thirdly, I like to focus on the importance of structural confrontation between the United States and China, as also previous speakers mentioned well. The important point is that we are now seeing the evolution of compartmentalized globalization. Now China is trying to realign supply chain and realign the economic space in Asia. Because both United States and Europe have become much more hostile to Chinese activities. That's why I think that China is trying to be closer to the ASEAN. Nowadays, the ASEAN is the biggest trading partner to China. So under the current coronavirus situation, China is trying to create a very deep, strong Asian economic space. So the question is how United States, China, uh, sorry, United, United States, Europe, and Japan try to face the current difficulty. The United States government under the President Joe Biden is trying to create much stronger uh, cooperation among democracies. So. In uh, the U.S.-Japan summit meeting in April this year, and also in the uh, last week's Quad summit meeting in Washington, D.C., I think that the United States government is focusing on the importance of emerging technologies 
and the cooperation among democracies or the core four democracies, the United States, Japan, India, and Australia in the areas of emerging technologies. So we need to realize that now globalization is much more divided and compartmentalized. The question we are facing now is further, uh, we, we, we try to end this compartmentalization or whether we try to focus on the importance of cooperation among uh, uh, Sorry, uh, perhaps uh, my connection is so I try to uh, reconnect. I will end just I like by saying that uh, both Europe and Europe are seeing uh, the importance of the current quite a rapid transformation of the nature of globalization. So, uh, we, I mean, both European countries and Japan are now wanting American agenda of creating cooperation among democracies. But how to respond to China's challenge? Maybe this will become the big question for us in the current World OC conference this year. Thank you very much, uh, you Tracy, for your very kind uh, uh, invitation to the Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor, for this. Uh, impressive vision. Uh, we appreciate enormously the effort you are making to be connected to this, uh, to this room. It was great, great uh, pleasure to hear you. Let me turn now to Marie Kevin Yemi, uh, 41st Prime Minister of Finland, as I already said, and what we are expecting from you, you have the last word after all, <laughs> Marie, so please, so, we, uh, we will benefit from your understanding of the of the very complex and multi-layered and multi-dimensional issue that we are dealing with. Please. Thank you very much and thank you, first of all, for the invitation. So happy to be here again. Thank you, Thierry and the organizers uh, uh, for letting us uh, discuss this interesting theme uh, here today. And a lot has been already said uh, and it's always difficult to be the last speaker uh, and find new angles uh, to the discussion. But a question I would like to actually answer is that uh, what did uh, COVID-19 change something? I mean, uh, did it uh, kind of mutate, globalize into a certain uh, direction? And uh, actually, in, uh, it kind of did good for, for globalization and at least it brought some new elements. And I think that the positive aspect really is that it underlined the essence of international cooperation and uh, multilateralism. It brought very high on the agenda the need for global action like cooperation in vaccine production and delivery and also joint measures preventing the virus uh, to, to uh, spread. And uh, it showed how dependent we are from each other and also in that sense uh, kind of made us all uh, see how important it's also in the future to make sure uh, that we can assure uh, the global value change to uh, to uh, function, but also it made visible that it's utmost important to uh, have a very good international cooperation, but also it so, uh, showed us some flaws uh, uh, when it comes to taking care of the uh, uh, pandemic and organizing everything. But uh, positive also is that it actually didn't trigger an increased willingness to implement unnecessary trade and trade-related protectionist measures in the area of goods. And Minister Buck already actually uh, referred to this fact. And when you look at, for example, the report prepared uh, to the G20 countries by WTO, UNCTAD and OECD, you can see there that since the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, 140 trade and trade-related measures in the area of goods had, have been implemented by G20 economies and 72% of them were trade facilitating, uh, of trade facilitating nature and 28% uh, and only could be considered trade restrictive. But then when you look at the rollback of uh, those uh, measures, 
the trade facilitating measures has been the rollback of them has been swifter than the rollback of trade restrictive measures. So really, you have to be careful in order to to watch what's happening. Uh, and another good example of uh, of that uh, positive uh, progress is the tax agreement in June, where 130 tourist addictions are uh, updated to international tax uh, agreement concerning multinational enterprise prices. So uh, very good steps uh, forward have been made. But many of you already pointed out that it is challenging uh, to, to govern uh, the in international order uh, and, and really make sure uh, that uh, the rules-based international order uh, is able to uh, kind of uh, uh, manage the, the biggest challenges uh, we are facing. And I think that COVID really made visible two megatrends uh, where this uh, international rules-based uh, order is needed, namely digitalization and uh, climate change. So it's uh, at the most important in these areas to achieve better multilateral, multilateral governance frameworks and international uh, rules. For example, when it comes to digitalization, uh, we really have to be able to facilitate the digital transformation of our economies and, and really create effective values-based digital regulatory frameworks and state-of-the-art global standards. And uh, Bertrand already mentioned when it comes to, to climate change, the need for a comprehensive global carbon pricing system that is one of the really concrete tools which we should uh, reach uh, in order to uh, 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 tackle the climate uh, change uh, by uh, the rules uh, decided uh, together at the global level. But uh, uh, it is still kind of a bit uh, disappointing and that despite the fact that we all have seen during this pandemic how important it is uh, to have deep uh, global uh, cooperation but uh, and how useful globalization uh, is that we still have uh, protectionism and populism uh, which threaten uh, to unravel kind of the decades of uh, international cooperation and openness and I think that we really have to put people uh, in the center and this is very much a political question, as was uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, by Masoud earlier in, in his in intervention. So we have to look at the national level and, and the national uh, policies, policies, and there is no silver bullet. And I think that we have been discussing kind of the ways how to make everyone see uh, the benefits of globalization and what kind of policies should be implemented in order to make globalization work for for all, but and I think that we have all the elements on, on board mm. already. We need more information, uh, and uh, and also we have to uh, tackle uh, the misinformation. Uh, and it's kind of alarming that in many countries you don't have <coughs> specific policies uh, introduced or, or frameworks uh, to to guide. Uh, kind of the response to mis- and disinformation. Uh, so sp spreading information uh, and also tackling the misinformation are uh, those uh, tools which should be uh, used in order to kind of uh, uh, make everyone see uh, the benefits of, of globalization. Uh, but then, as I already said, kind of the third uh, point uh, when it comes to the recipe, how to uh, make it uh, uh, politically accepted uh, to really move forward in the global governance and also uh, making sure that the globalization uh, really uh, works uh, also uh, uh, in the future is that we have not been able in many countries to make sure that uh, the benefits of, of globalization uh, are not uh, shared equally and everyone has 
the opportunity to participate in the society. And, and this is something uh, which uh, we really uh, have to pay attention, uh, make sure uh, that everyone ha has the access to education uh, and uh, also you need active labor market policies, uh, social protection and, and so on. Uh, I think there's uh, already uh, those uh, uh, issues mentioned many times uh, when, when it comes to kind of the recipe, how to uh, make people understand uh, the benefits of globalization and also how to make uh, the globalization uh, work uh, better uh, for all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Marie, for the uh, stress you are putting on fair share of the bounties of uh, globalization as one of the major problems we have to cope with. I'm struck by the fact that when uh, I hear all, all members uh, of this panel, uh, one of the elements which they underlined was the acceleration of underlying <coughs> trends. The, the, uh, formidable amplification and acceleration uh, through all possible dimensions. And it seems to me that uh, the, the speed limit in some respect has been overpassed and our own people are saying it goes too fast. Please cool down, uh, try to uh, have a, a slower speed and we cannot. The problem is that we cannot. Anyway, it was absolutely stimulating. I'm sure that we will have questions from the audience, so I open uh, the question part of our session and I would urge the question to be as short and concise as possible and be directed to one of the panelists if it is possible. Who wants to take the floor? Yeah. Uh, my name is John Andrews. Um, thank you very much for very interesting interventions. Uh, in terms of the rivalry between China and the United States, I mean, China, I think, now has more trading partners. I mean, more countries take China as their main trading partner than do uh, countries take the U.S. as their main trading partner. So if we have this confrontation between the U.S. and China uh, at the political level and also at the economic level, um, is the, are, is the world going to have to make a choice between China and the US? Or is there a way of avoiding that choice? Uh, in other words, are we on an inexorable pathway towards some kind of divided economic and trading world? Or can we somehow avoid what I think would be a rather um, damaging and unfortunate uh, destination? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Perhaps I could ask Thomas to say a word on this uh, very stimulating question. And also uh, Yushi Osoya, if he wishes. And you, Minister, uh, on this uh, very, very stimulating again question. Very concisely, Thomas. It's effectively a question very difficult for me, but I think we have to try to answer in distinguishing the attitude of the des acteurs économiques et des entreprises. Et à mon avis, le choix se fera euh, très différemment selon les secteurs d'activité. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a des secteurs d'activité qui, euh, qui sont au cœur de la confrontation sino-américaine, d'autres qui le sont moins. Et pour ceux qui sont au cœur de la confrontation sino-américaine, je pense en particulier euh, à, la, à la querelle actuelle sur les, sur les microprocesseurs. Euh, Ça, ça c'est le, le premier aspect, c'est l'aspect entreprise. Le deuxième aspect pour les États, je crois que tout le monde cherche à éviter précisément ce choix. Alors il y a des phénomènes d'alliance qui s'accélèrent là aussi. Et la dernière en date, c'est l'annonce d'Ocus. Mais la plupart des pays souhaitent précisément éviter d'être piégés dans cette, dans cette confrontation sino-américaine. Donc je répondrai en distinguant les deux, les deux niveaux. Merci beaucoup. Tayo, uh, you have the floor. Okay, uh, this question is frequently asked to uh, Korean companies in you know, whether you choose this or not. But uh, look at China. Uh, China has been a world factory for many, many years. Now it's changing because of high wages in China. Many firms are already leaving China to ASEAN and other countries. So for Korean firms, they are having a different strategy. 
They want to use China as a big market in the future, not the production or assembly site. So I think that they can actually readjust their, their destination. However, if the U.S. want to have a decoupling by force or by you know, strong argument, then Korean firms are having some trouble. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Yoshi, also, yeah, a word on that question? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great question. And uh, I would say that majority of Asian countries are denying and rejecting such a choice. Let me uh, give you one example. Japan's single alliance partner is the United States. Uh, so we have to enhance our alliance relationship with the United States. But on the other hand, China is our biggest trading partner. Not just that. Japan has provided the largest amount of ODA to China in total. My Indian friend told me that the current powerful uh, uh, assertive China is part of the open culture. I wouldn't say that, but anyway, China is part of it. So this means that we need to create a inclusive regional order or inclusive globalization with China. At the same time, China needs to put some of the important rules. If China would not uh, put rules and uh, important uh, uh, rule of law, China would uh, dam damage its own national interest. So I think that this is a majority voice in Asia, but it depends on how much China is willing to respect such rules and uh, rule of law or international <coughs> norms. And I'm optimistic more or less about Chinese behavior in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So it was really indeed a very important question. We will take another question. Uh, I, I would like to reserve at least six, uh, I would say, uh, something like seven minutes for each of us to have the last word, but in 60 seconds, <laughs> you know, the main conclusion. So we will have a question, but uh, I want to terminate, terminate in time. So a new question from the audience if possible. Yeah, over there. Ambassador to the US. Please. Um, I have God knows how many iPhones. When I buy iPhones, who do I trade with? China or the United States? So? Can somebody answer this question? These things are made in, the, in China, I believe. But they're American. What I'm trying to say is that when I buy something that is made that, that is made in China, but that is American, who am I trading with? Can I'm you, sorry, I'm not sure I got the question. My my my, my point is that is that they're they're so integrated. Yeah, yeah. That you can't separate separate them in, in, in many things. It is so profoundly intertwined that it yes, would be very difficult to disentangle. Okay, got the message. Uh, we had another question there. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, I would like to address my question to the Minister of Finland, which I thought was very stimulating. What she was talking about was the need for global solidarity and global cooperation in the light of the pandemic. But what I can say is, is that the European states have been extremely e egoistic in this particular field, and this is what we are, there is a great deal of inequality between the different countries, how they have provided the, uh, they have provided the means to to, to fight this pandemic. It was very unequal, and this is what we are very uh, sorry about, the lack of global solidarity and the lack of global cooperation in this particular field. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say that you could address the same reproach to all advanced economy, not only, it seems to me, to the European economies, but you know what? We will start, okay. Matty, yes. <laughs> the conclusion session.
Yes. Starting with you. You good. have a question. Thank you. I, you yeah, good. Thank you. I'll, I'll do. We'll conclude. Good. Please. That is a very good question. I, I really think that we, we need more solidarity when it comes to kind of action delivery. But of course, all the countries, I mean, the developed ones have done their part. Also the European Union, United States. So you cannot say that they, there was no solidarity. But more could have been done. But I also can understand the ministers uh, in European countries and developed countries, they have to answer to their citizens. They need the vaccines rapidly. But also uh, answering partly to the question of, of our iPhones, where they are uh, produced. Uh, I mean, that really shows us how interdependent we are. The vaccines going also to developing countries, uh, they benefit the developed ones because of the global value chains, because of the raw materials. So in that, that sense, we really are on the same uh, boat. And I hope that now when we are, uh, I hope rather soon facing the end of this pandemic that we have also learned from this, that more solidarity also uh, is needed because it's hel it helps everyone, also your own, own country. Thank you so much, uh, Marie. Uh, Wishy. 60 seconds for <laughs> your final message, please. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, actually, 70%, around 70% iPhone components they come from Japan, Japanese. Companies. So this also tells that there is a great role in this globalized world. And uh, maybe we have to make the current friendly international atmosphere to make the first of the iPhone possible. Thank you very much indeed. Thomas, 60 seconds. Alors, 60 seconds. Peut-être uh, souligner le rôle des absolument, à mon avis, crucial des plateformes systémiques et, et d'illustrer le changement de référence mentale qui était le nôtre en une génération. Je m'explique. 1996, euh, en marge de Davos, déclaration d'indépendance du cyberespace par John Barlow, qui montre l'utopie de libération de l'époque. Et euh, 25 ans plus tard, le terme de capitalisme de surveillance utilisé par Sochana Zuboff, qui montre à quel point euh, cette utopie s'est évaporée et invite à, à s'interroger très précisément sur... Euh, l'extraction des données, qui va être la tendance qui va continuer à croître, et la, 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 la mondialisation va passer principalement par là, et le rôle donc entre ces plateformes systémiques, les autorités publiques et les individus. Merci beaucoup. Marc Taillot, vous avez le floor. Uh, again, 60 secondes. Je veux introduire la situation en Geneva, autour uh, du WTO. Le multilateral agreement est presque impossible. So they are arguing that maybe plurilateral agreement among like-minded countries should be formed. And some people also oppose their approach because it's not very good for the WTO system. But uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, Brazilian ambassador argued that if you want to have a choice, we want a choice, fragmentation with the plurilateral agreement or irrelevance. This, is a, this, this will simplify the situation at the WTO right now. We should choose fragmentation rather than in irrelevance for the future of WTO. <laughs> Point very well made. Thank you very much. Bertrand, que diriez-vous? Yes, I think my, my point will be very simple. We have agreed six years ago on a global roadmap for the 21st century, a roadmap for an inclusive, sustainable and resilient economy the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agreement on Financing for Development, and uh, the Climate Agreement. It's impossible to withdraw an agreement today. So let's stick to what we have. It's not perfect. It's very difficult to handle. But it's been signed by everybody, so it's time to be serious about it. I think we have all the pieces of the puzzle. We never had that much money available. We never had that much technology available. We have all the institutions. We don't need to reinvent the G20, etc. They do exist. We have probably to make them work. It's easier said than done, obviously. And, and so we have to make the puzzle work. And, and let me conclude with two quotes, which basically highlight what I think is important today. One is from a, a, a French writer from the 1930s, not very well known, but actually my daughter had to read it this summer for baccalaureate, Jean Giraudoux. Jean Giraudoux wrote a, a, a theater play in 1935, 
called the War of Troy will not happen, which of course was anticipation to the Second World War. Discussion between Odysseus and Hector, and of course they see the catastrophe uh, coming, and they say the privilege the grand of the rich and powerful is to believe they can watch a catastrophe from the balcony. And as we very well know, when the catastrophe happened, the balcony collapsed as well. So I think we are the balcony, and we, we see these things coming. We have hopes, and we have to make it work. It's our particular responsibility in this room. And my, my last quote is from Theodore Roosevelt, which I rediscovered in the US when I visited Mount Rushmore. I, I didn't know he was a fourth guy on the Mount Rushmore between Lincoln, Jefferson, and, and Washington. And Theodore Roosevelt is known for you know, the dismantling of the, of the uh, conglomerates, the creation of a consumer protection agency, the national park, etc., was accused of being revolutionary. And he said, I'm not advocating revolution, I'm advocating action to prevent revolution. And I think this is precisely where we are today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your quotations. Masoud, what would you say? I just want to make one point, which is that uh, if you take the next 30 years, in almost every field, no global solution will be possible unless a large number of emerging market and developing countries are part of that solution. Because that is where the growth is happening, that is where emissions will increase, that is where populations are growing. And the systems that we have to integrate them into the decision-making process do not reflect that. So we have to really find better ways of integrating those economies into the decision-making process and we have to be more realistic in the promises we make because we are very good on targets and promises, very poor on delivery. And that's why you see in so many areas, we make promises and if the last thing I say is, if you were to say what is one of the real costs of the COVID crisis, it is a breakdown of trust. Many people in developing countries have lost trust in the functioning of the current multilateral international system because the promises that were made are not being delivered either in finance or in access to vaccines. And I do feel that we have to write that to redress that balance to be able to move forward to address the other issues. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mazou. Uh, I would nevertheless, if you permit, mention the fact that thanks to globalization, we have many, many, many millions, billions yes, of citizens of that of went out of poverty. Of so so the, the, the benefit, course. the bounties we know exist, yes. but inequalities, abnormal behavior of the rich vis-a-vis uh, -vis the poor are uh, of course at stake as you so eloquently made the point. Let me <laughs> myself, have a quotation, quotation for Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky said, <laughs> no sane person is opposed to globalization, that is international integration. Surely not the left and the worker movements, which were founded on the principle of international solidarity. That's, of course, a contradiction. But, of course, good globalization, good global governance, fair sharing of the bounties are absolutely at stake at a global level between countries and within countries. Thank you very, very much indeed. I think we had a very stimulating session and now we have to turn to the next session. All the best. Thank you.